the following is a segment from the Carl King Podcast. If you enjoy this show, be sure to like, subscribe, and send us burritos. What you're about to hear is an abridged excerpt from my book, Robots and Aliens, which you can only get on Patreon at the $5 level and up. It's 125 pages or so, and this segment was edited together from portions of a few different chapters. So, here we go. In June 1997, I released Sir Millard Mulch, Seven Pot-Boiling Delusions. The cover of that cassette featured an awkward black-and-white photo of me in my friend Brad Freeze's bedroom wearing a light gray shirt that was way too big and some sunglasses... Not the famous green ones, though. I also superimposed a dollar sign on my shirt. My thinking at the time was, this photo makes no sense and also makes me laugh. But it wasn't weird enough to be attention-getting, and it didn't convey anything about the music. I look back at that photo as a bad choice for cover art. About the title, a pot boiler is a work of art made solely for commercial purposes. And since my music was instrumental prog rock with absurdist humor, the opposite of commercial, it felt like a proper ironic name. The cassette had, as you can guess, seven tracks. Broccoli, Perfectly Square, also known as The Boy with the Perfectly Square Butthole, Grandpa Al vs. the Hoth Wampa, The Definition of Banana, Who? 15 Interesting Things to Do with Tiny Chairs, and the outro track, Good Night. It was Pat McDonald on D-drums and me physically playing everything else, all of the guitar, bass, vocals, and keyboards. I ordered 100 tapes duplicated by Clarity Cassette in Maine, and I designed the packaging myself using, I think, Corel Draw at Max Graphics, the little print shop I worked at in Venice, Florida. When it came time to print them, Their pressman messed up the three-color offset printing of the J-cards, which were on glossy cardstock. Now, it's rare to run only 100 prints of a three-color job due to each color needing films and a separate pass through the press. It was definitely overkill. The fact that almost all of that short run was printed wrong is a testament to my lack of resources and Venice, Florida, conspiring against me. I selected one print from that failed batch that looked kind of acceptable and resorted to running it through the Max Graphics color copier. Now, understand, I had to do all of that because there was no way to directly print from the multicolor computer file to the color copier on the far side of the room. PDFs existed, but were unheard of in small print shops at that time. And having an original cassette cover with any kind of color was a big deal. I was attempting to distinguish myself from black and white photocopied cassette covers. As far as getting it out there, I'm pretty sure I mailed out just three copies to important people. One to Trey Spruance of Mr. Bungle, one to the address in the liner notes of Steve Vai's Fire Garden CD, and one to Jello Biafra at Alternative Tentacles. And it's likely I sold a few for $7 each to some locals, but nothing worth remembering. I was surprised that the cassette actually got a couple of reviews in regional magazines like Jam and Inc. 19. At some point, I also sent a copy of my tape to Devin Townsend, and he mentioned it, in an online magazine as one of his current favorites. And later that year, I attended the Florida Drum Expo in Tampa, where I interrupted Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater on stage as he spoke to the audience to hand him my very important cassette. This was probably in front of thousands of people. I never heard anything about it from him, but years later, he did buy one of my albums on CD Baby. The experience of making that tape was a high point in my life. I felt proud of myself, and I expected the world to feel the same. I thought that the music was so good that I feared how much it would blow up. 
I believed that my success would come from the outside. Like any day now, some external force would reward me for my talent and hard work. I imagined it would be one of these following things. One, a record label would sign me. Number two, a band I loved would ask me to join or open for them, like Steve Vai, Mr. Bungle, Primus, or Devin Townsend. Number three, someone important would wave their hands and just make things happen. And if one of those things would occur, I'd never need to get a stupid day job again. I'd be on sort of a train with perpetual career motion. This was all a very urgent matter. And when nothing immediately happened, I crashed into depression and felt like a failure. I really had no idea what to do next because Pat McDonald had moved to Nashville and I didn't know anyone else who could play my music. I had no band and everyone told me the same thing. I had to tour and I felt stuck until I could do that. At the time, it seemed unacceptable for me to just plug in my bass or guitar and play over backing tracks. It somehow wouldn't have felt legit. But looking back, I could have easily done that. I truly didn't need a band. Now, the rest of 1997 was a dark time. I continued in music school, but I was consumed by anger. I did not want to be there. I wanted to be touring, playing my complicated music. And what was I supposed to do? Make yet another tape and without Pat? For the fall semester at school, I switched over to percussion as my principal instrument. I joined the wind ensemble, which played a lot of patriotic Sousa marches. And in one of the pieces, I had my very own extended snare drum solo that went on forever. My financial condition, broke, <laughs> would have been completely normal for a full-time college student, which I was. But at the time, it was a source of embarrassment for me. I felt enormous pressure to make something of myself. And I resented having such crappy jobs and being dependent on my mom. Because in that situation, I lacked the power to do what I wanted. Record my own albums, run a record label, put a Sir Millard Mulch band together, and tour the world. I mean, every day that I didn't make it was... Another day of feeling like a failure. And college was taking too long. I was freaking out. The truth is, I was too impatient. Back then, I didn't view those years as my early years. As far as I was concerned, there was no future. Whatever I was going to do, I had to do it now. When they were my age, Mr. Bungle had already made their first album on Warner Brothers, and Steve Vai was working for Frank Zappa. At the old age of 22, I felt that I was falling behind. My standards were impossibly high. I was comparing myself to the only examples I knew of, which were highly visible rock stars who achieved an unlikely, outrageous level of success. But I was committing a thinking error. Since I didn't know of anyone who didn't succeed making that kind of music, I must be the only one failing. And I know now that I was being unfair to myself. In September of 97, Flail drove me up to Atlanta to see Strapping Young Lad. And I was determined to meet Devin Townsend in person. We got to the venue early in the day and I found Devin sitting outside in the tour van, which was crudely painted with the SYL logo. He was drawing a pencil sketch of Johnny Cash. And he told me he hated hair, and that, quote, humans are pink blobs of flesh with shit growing out the top, unquote. So anyway, we talked for a couple of hours, and I asked him naive questions, and I shared my frustration about the definition of banana being the most memorable track on my tape, to which he replied, quote, technical ability be damned when delivering an exposition on fruit, unquote. The thing that shocked me was that he wasn't living a glamorous life. He showed me the jars of peanut butter the band lived on, and how many CDs and tapes bands gave him when he was on tour. He had the naked discs jammed all along into the sides of the ceiling of the van. 
And I thought, wow, so many people are trying to get him to listen to their music. I felt kind of lucky to sort of be friends with him. After that, we kept in touch, and through our continued correspondence, he went on to disillusion me even more about the music industry. His own bad experiences related to me via email made me extremely angry because I identified with all of it. Out of desperation, I plotted the creation of a full-length Sir Millard Mulch CD, and the idea for including 50 songs came from a package of Christmas lights I saw at Target, because, hey, you gotta get your ideas anywhere you can. Plus, 50 songs was the perfect, absurd amount for an album, because who does that? It would at least stand out from everyone else. It would be titled... 50 Intellectually Stimulating Themes from a Cheap Amusement Park for Robots and Aliens, Volume 1. Well, there you go. To read the entire Robots and Aliens book, join my Patreon for $5 or more. If you enjoyed this segment from the Carl King Podcast, remember, you can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or through an old rubber hose.